Hello and welcome everybody to this live stream where we learn how to build embedded systems, which is also what we do in the academy. But here is a very short and uh, condensed 13 step, uh, 13 step list basically of tips and ideas. So let's get started. First of all, I got some news for you. Uh, I've got a C programming workshop uh, coming up today. Uh, we also have on Tuesday artist fundamentals. We have uh, on Wednesday STM32 programming. Uh, on Thursday it is KiCad, and these are already booked. Uh, so um, you can uh, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna add a link here. I'm gonna add a link in the description uh, where you can where you can register. You can you can still register for today, and even if you register on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, you can get uh, you can get the recording of the workshop. Number two, I'm looking for teachers who are uh, able and uh, capable of teaching computer science, uh, teaching all the concepts of uh, programming, PCB design, uh, schematic, electronics, uh, basically everything that we're going to be looking at today. We have a full list of, uh, of skills that are required to build embedded system products. So if you are a teacher and uh, you want to share your knowledge with a greater audience, then you're welcome to contact me. And uh, you do that by sending an email to info at uh, Also, the back end is uh, being redesigned, so uh, I'm adding more content and it's a it's an iterative process where the content is constantly being improved. But um, I'm going to be redesigning the back end. It's actually going to be a lot more straightforward and a lot more uh, streamlined uh, content where you can learn step by step. So that's coming up as well. Uh, so we have 13 steps to uh, making an embedded systems product and we start with uh, we don't only include computer science stuff we even include marketing and sales and uh, this process works uh, as follows now the reason for having marketing as number one is because uh, marketing is what answers all the questions for you when you um, when you start uh, with your product idea. So you, you really have to start with marketing, kind of looking at what is working, what people want and uh, what, uh, what problems they're having. And then you uh, go into team building and then you go into programming and actual development and then you finish off with sales. So um, number one, uh, what do you need to do to, to learn marketing? Well, you have to be able to drive traffic to your offers and marketing is a lot about offers. So marketing is not about the product, it's about the offers and kind of uh, presenting things uh, to people where product comes in to fulfill the promises of the marketing. Uh, and this is where a lot of startups don't really understand it. They think they, think they have to start with the product, but in reality, it's actually the offer that is the starting point. And then the product is actually coming in uh, way far in the end of, of the process. So you need to be able to measure it. You need to be able to track things. And uh, this is uh, done using pixels and other tracking tools. Uh, Google Analytics is one example of a tracking tool where you can track visitors. Uh, you can track uh, how uh, visitors uh, navigate the website. So there's a lot more tools like that. Um, and that's important to to learn when you do when you do any kind of social media marketing, any any kind of interaction on the internet. Uh, also, uh, people are searching on Google for things. A lot of businesses are um, not using Google to the maximum. So, uh, learning how to how to leverage those uh, billions of searches uh, on Google every day that's really really beneficial. Um, we also have uh, business administration. You need to have talents. You need to have a math person, an art person, a video person, a, wor a written word person, basically a copywriter. Um, you need to have a creative strategist, uh, which is a, a new term that's been coined in the later years, uh, where a person actually goes through a lot of the social media interactions and kind of uh, picks out trends uh, where people discuss things online. Maybe people discuss things on forums and this person actually goes in and uh, analyzes the discussions. And uh, you also uh, have a career ladder. So you start as a programmer, probably. You then uh, manage a team. You then uh, do communication and sales. And uh, also at the, at the top of the kind of like a person that has an overview of everything is, is the visionary who come up, comes up with a new idea, who uh, implements a new idea. Uh, and uh, actually, everybody works together, obviously, to implement a new idea. You need to learn microcontrollers and CPUs. You need to understand how 
to correctly program peripherals on a microcontroller, uh, how to use registers uh, on a microcontroller. You need to understand how to handle exceptions and interrupts. Uh, you need to understand uh, how peripherals are clocked and how um, adjusting the clock uh, speeds of peripherals can save you battery time. Because a lot of devices today are IoT devices and they need to have good battery management. They need to save battery uh, power if they are uh, powered by battery. So a battery might, might need to last for 10 years and uh, the device needs to be able to do that. You have uh, tool chains. One good tool to have is a logic analyzer. You can use an oscilloscope as well, but uh, the benefit of a logic analyzer is really to, uh, uh, to have more channels. So you can have uh, more than just four channels that you have on an oscilloscope, uh, and you can record the logical transitions on the wires all at the same time. Now, you can also do this using uh, the debugging um, boundary uh, check, boundary analysis, where you can actually get uh, through JTAG, you can actually get um, the cha the pin changes on a chip. So that's also very useful. But the logic analyzer is good when you need to really um, analyze sort of the, the signals on the wires. For example, you want to record the serial communication that's coming out of your chip. Um, and uh, and you, you want to know what, what is going on. You want to know how bits are transmitted. Maybe there is some um, uh, wrong timing on on the clock, and for that you can use a logic analyzer. Uh, this is a this is a logic analyzer built on top of the Lattice FPGA. Uh, it's called the Lattice Ice Forty. It's also it's also called the Ice Stick, uh, which is a very um, easy to program FPGA. It it has a lot of uh, open source tools available for programming it, and um, it has enough memory to uh, to build simple designs um, on top of it. We then have, uh, you need to understand operating system design. So uh, anything related to Artos concepts, hard real time versus soft real time, uh, use cases for Artos primitives, tasks, semaphores, mutexes, um, queues, events, timers. Um, I've put up an introductory course uh, on Artos concepts into the academy, so you can check it out there. Uh, designing software using Artos concepts. Um, it's also something we're going to be looking at this week. Um, introduction to this, uh, we'll be actually discussing this on the workshop uh, later this week. So today we're going to be doing uh, C programming and we're going to be discussing Artos later. Um, Schematic design, we have the most common mistakes in schematic design. You, you can have pins, for example, TX and RX pins not connected cor correctly because uh, TX has to go to an RX on the other side. Uh, and sometimes uh, they get connected to the same, to the same. Um, so TX gets connected to another TX pin, that's wrong. Uh, mismatched volt voltage levels. Uh, some circuits are five volt circuits, some circuits are 3.3 volt, although, although uh, nowadays, uh, it's it's more common that you have 3.3 volts and then you have maybe something with a lower voltage. Uh, and you, you really have to sort of make sure that you get the right um, uh, voltage level. And it's also specifically common when you have analog signals. So when you have some measurement coming in, sometimes you might, you might have a uh, higher voltage than you, what your ADC is able to support. So uh, very important to kind of look at the schematic and, uh, and try to figure that out because um, when it comes to analog signals specifically, it's it's harder to have the tool uh, tell you that something's wrong because uh, it's not always obvious for the tool uh, what uh, voltage level is going to come out on the on the output. Uh, push uh, pull connected to another push pull. So if you have a push pull, it's basically two transistors where a high level is connecting that output to uh, plus three point three volts, and a low level is connecting that output to ground. If you connect them together, and one is uh, one is uh, pushing and another one is pulling, then they're going to be basically shorting the power line. Uh, so that's important. Uh, also, if you have uh, outputs that are uh, capable of uh, sort of tree state output, uh, if you don't have any signal on the output, uh, then uh, anything that is on the same net uh, might not be able to identify what level is on that wire unless you either pull it up or pull it down. So uh, if you have something that is not always being driven, uh, which is also said to be high Z or high impedance, uh, high, high, uh, basically the line is, is um, uh, getting into high impedance state uh, when it's not being driven at all, when it's not uh, being pulled up either, uh, then um, you need to make sure that you have pull ups or pull downs on, on, this, uh, on this line. 
Um, also analog circuits, and this is really fun because um, before digital electronics, uh, people were designing uh, control systems using amplifiers. And so uh, amplifiers uh, were used to create uh, summations, uh, to create difference, uh, basic mathematical operations, uh, to create uh, differentiations and uh, integrations. And uh, all of these are components of a PID controller. Uh, and an amplifier is actually also uh, incorporating the gain of the amplification gain, which is also uh, would be the, the proportional term in a PID controller. So before we had digital electronics, we had amplifiers that were used to build PID controllers. And you can still do that. And it's actually a really fun exercise to look at this because um, when you're working with amplifiers, you're also going to be working in, in time domain and not the discrete domain uh, that is more relevant to, uh, to writing things in code. But the principles are the same, and it's actually um, educational to, to try to build uh, mathematical functions using amplifiers uh, as opposed to doing that in code. So it gives you a, a deeper understanding of how things actually work. Um, then we have also most common mistakes in PCB layout, uh, which is, for example, that you have a via that is that is too uh, too thin, uh, going through a line that uh, is designed to carry a lot of current. And uh, vias are quite thin. Like if you use default vias that you would use for signal, and you use that on a power rail, uh, you would have the via heat up, and it might not be able to to handle the current on the power rail. So. Um, it's important to look at uh, how many vias you're using. So if, if you're using uh, thin vias, you can use more vias to, to increase the current. Uh, and there is a there, there are calculation tools. For example, you have the PCB calculator in KiCad where you can actually calculate uh, the correct uh, sizes for your tracks. Uh, and you can look up how much a via can handle uh, depending on uh, the diameter of the via as well. Uh, you can have tracks that are too thin to carry the current, uh, which means they're going to heat up and they might actually burn out. You have uh, um, short rise time uh, signals too close to important other signals. So if you have a very short, so this, the speed, the high speed uh, design in circuit boards is basically the rise time. We're talking about rise time. If a rise time is really, really fast, then you have a lot of harmonics uh, on that signal. And so they're going to be um, they, they're going to be transmitting uh, radio waves to other signals. So it's going to be like uh, through inductance, it, it's going to affect other uh, lines on the PCB board. And so if they're too close to other important signals, they're going to be uh, injecting noise into those other signals. And so when you have really fast lines, you want to sort of route them away from other, from other uh, sensitive signals. Uh, you might have bypass capacitors that are too far away from pins, which means they're not going to have the same effect. Uh, they're not going to have the same filtering effect on, um, uh, on filtering the power to the chip and from the chip. Too little space between components creating uh, solder mask breaks. Uh, and this really uh, shows up when, you, when, you have, uh, when the board is being soldered. If there is a solder mask break, uh, the solder is actually going to uh, go between the pins and it's, it's going to create a little bubble uh, of solder and uh, the components might actually move uh, together and, and stick together and that creates uh, errors in, in the connections, like the component can actually not get soldered properly if there is a solder mask break. Um, next we have programming, uh, you need to understand the algorithm complexity. Uh, so I have uh, sketch, I, I have uh, six different algorithm complexities here. You, you have the most basic uh, constant time uh, complexity, uh, which means that uh, the algorithm runs uh, constantly, regardless of how many uh, how many items you have in in your list. You have uh, the logarithmic time, uh, which uh, kind of flattens out. You have the linear time, which grows linearly uh, with the number of items uh, that that you're processing. You have quadratic time, uh, cubic time, and exponential time, and those are growing exponentially, um, which is uh, this uh, light blue line, for example. This is uh, the time it takes to execute the algorithm. So the more work there is to do, the exponentially more uh, time it takes, and uh, eventually it goes to infinity. So you want to avoid those exponential time algorithms uh, as much as possible. Uh, and if you can do something at uh, logarithmic time, it's really good. Uh, if you could do it in constant time, for example, like uh, doing a calculation, um, uh, 
um, like a, a mathematical calculation that does not depend on number of items, that's even better. Uh, but usually when you're processing lists, you're going to have something that depends on n. And uh, if you can get it to logarithmic time, you should be really happy about it. Uh, we have uh, also, in terms of mathematics, what is useful for embedded systems? You need to understand statistics. So Bayesian statistics is important for controller and estimator design. So whenever you're going to be working with filters or uh, cal like Kalman filters, for example, when you, whenever you're going to be working with controllers, you're going to be kind of uh, using those uh, statistical tools to, uh, to create an estimator that uh, minimizes the error uh, in, in your estimated signal. You need to understand the numerical analysis for finding uh, quick solutions numerically. Um, and uh, you need to, sometimes you need to understand uh, fixed point mathematics. Although nowadays you have microcontrollers that have uh, floating point support and uh, it's really recommended to use the, the floating point support if, it's, if it is available or maybe you can pay a little bit more for a chip to have floating point support because it really just simplifies things uh, when you're writing your code. You don't need to uh, put too much thought into how you're actually making your mathematical operations. You can focus on the algorithm itself. Um, and that's usually uh, a, a great time saver uh, to, to have floating point support in hardware. Uh, we have the uh, HDL FPGA, uh, basically a logical design. And uh, I'm going to be going in, into more details about this uh, later. Uh, we have uh, testing. The process, uh, basically testing is the process of searching for uh, software errors. Um, software documentation, uh, it involves product requirements, uh, which, which you start with, functional specifications, what, what should it uh, do, um, user interface if there is any, test cases uh, and traceability of um, uh, final, like traceability metrics uh, is basically kind of being able to um, uh, trace things throughout the project. So for example, when there is a git commit, it should be traceable to a um, to something in the functional or product requirement document, functional specification and product requirement document. So it, it has to be like everything should be traceable. And this is called DevOps, um, this, this whole process as, as a whole, it's called DevOps. Um, and uh, finally, uh, on the step number 13 is basically sort of getting the product uh, out to the market and getting the product sold. And uh, all of these steps are um, sort of a step-by-step -step process to creating embedded system products. and uh, uh, one of the, um, and this is the, the main the main goal of the academy is actually to to kind of go through this process and to show you exactly how to do it. So if you um, uh, if you want to register, you can register for free today. Uh, the free registrations are still open because uh, we're testing a lot of content, and it's kind of. Um, it's an iterative process where things get improved all the time, but the free option is not going to be available for very much longer. It's it's kind of just a, a test right now. So uh, if you if you want to register, like go to the uh, switchembed.com forward slash free and get get your free account while it's still available.